It's finally happening. After years of being on the fringes and struggling, Rust is now slowly entering the mainstream. Now, if you're not really sure what I'm talking about, the White House put out a report that is 19 pages long that details the importance of using memory safe languages to enable a more safe cybersecurity future. And in particular, they call out languages like C and C++ for being unsafe and languages that are memory safe like Rust for being safe. In this video, we're gonna kind of break down this paper at the high points. I'm gonna give my commentary on it as a security researcher. If you're new here, this is a level learning, a channel where I do videos about software security and programming. So if you're new here, hit that subscribe button, I really appreciate it. So this paper is the output of a recently signed uh, national cybersecurity executive order that the president signed off uh, that's detailing how we can make America more secure from a cybersecurity standpoint and ultimately the world, right? President Biden's national cybersecurity strategy outlines two fundamental shifts, the need to both rebalance the responsibility to defend cyberspace and realign incentives to favor long-term cybersecurity investments. In this report, the case is made that the technical community is well postured to drive progress on both strategic goals. And the most important one for the sake of this video is First, in order to reduce memory safety vulnerabilities at scale, creators of software and hardware can better secure the building blocks of cyberspace. This report focuses on the programming language as a primary building block and explores hardware architecture and formal methods as complementary approaches to achieve similar outcomes. Whenever I say that a language is unsafe, I met with, oh, skill issue, L, like bad take, like just write better code. And like, sure, I, I totally agree that it is on the programmer to write secure software. However, comma, we are 50 years into a world that is written entirely by the C language. So how is it that after 50 years of improvements and security mitigations put onto the C language, we are still able to you know, write insecure software? Is it because that 50 years later, people still just have skill issues? Or is it that the language, while powerful, is not designed in a way that gives us secure software? Paper does go into this, but first they talk about kind of the reactionary state of cybersecurity. So users of software and hardware products are consistently placed in the untenable position of reacting to cyber emergencies. Responding on a crisis by crisis basis often leaves them on their heels and those securing systems on the front line should not be expected to bear the full weight of, the, of this burden. The intensive reactive posture demanded by the current status quo reduces defenders' ability to predict and prepare for the next wave of incom incoming attacks. So if you're a member of the cybersecurity or just the general tech community, you're probably aware that like most security teams are extremely reactionary. We don't have really defender roles. We more have incident responders, malware reverse engineers, and basically teams that are meant to, to put out a fire and not build a fireproof house. This posture stems from the fact that mitigating known software vulnerabilities is a complex systems problem and the current ecosystem does not sufficiently incentivize the investments required to secure the foundations of cyberspace. The problem they're highlighting here is so true in software up until like very recently, I mean, it's 2024 and like, up until literally within the last few years, security was an afterthought in software. It's like, build the thing, wrap it in duct tape, build the thing, slap some security on it. Security was not built from the foundation. And I think the reason that this happened is because profit is obviously the goal, right? If you can make a product, prove that it works and get it to market as fast as possible, you're going to have the most innovative thing and you're going to beat your competitors to market. If security is not a part of the profit equation, it'll always be an afterthought. And this is what they're saying about, you know, incentives, right? Because nothing really incentivizes companies to build secure software. If people are not incentivized to write secure code. Why would they? And then as a result, you have these teams that are constantly reacting to incidents and not able to properly prepare for them, A, because of a lack of staffing, but also because of B, the, the, the ecosystem is not designed around that. So this is just for known vulnerabilities, by the way. These are just CVEs, things that are already out there. However, even if every known vulnerability were to be fixed, the prevalence of undiscovered vulnerabilities across the software ecosystem would still be a present additional risk. A proactive approach that focuses on eliminating an entire class of vulnerabilities reduces the potential attack surface and results in more reliable code, less downtime, and more predictable systems. 
Ultimately, this approach enables the U.S. to foster economic growth, accelerate technological innovation, and protect national security. Programmers writing lines of code do not do so without consequence. The way they do their work is of critical importance to the national interest. And this is obvious for literally any country around the world. If you look at some of the videos that I've done, like the video on the Therax system, or even recent events like the Colonial Pipeline shutdown, when programmers write code, if it's not secure, people die or people lose money and not just people like corporate CEOs, like people who have jobs, people who have to go and go to the gas station and fill their truck up, like lose money. So it's so important to take your opinion. If even if it is, oh, it's just a skill issue and think a little harder about the problem at hand, right? The skill issue argument can't be true if it lasts for 50 years. We need to have more secure foundations. So in this report, they focus on programming languages as a primary building block and explore hardware architecture and formal methods, complementary approaches to achieve similar outcomes. Now, it may be you're watching this video and you don't actually know what memory safety is. You've heard that term kind of thrown around, but let's go into it. And I actually really, really like the way the White House broke this, uh, this down. Memory safety vulnerabilities are a class of vulnerability affecting how memory can be accessed, written, allocated, or deallocated in unintended ways. This is the nature of literally every exploit, right? People say, oh, when you write code, just write the code correctly. Well, if you write the code in a way where it has a vulnerability and you're able to exploit that vulnerability, the computer will just do what you tell it to do. So if you're able to overwrite metadata in the memory allocator, if you're able to overwrite the return pointer on your call stack, these are the fundamental flaws in software that enable hackers to do evil stuff. So experts have identified a few programming languages that both lack traits associated with memory safety and also have high proliferation across critical systems such as C and C++. And they have a little footnote if you want to go read the sources. But this is true. Literally, the entire world is propped up on code written in languages like C and C++ that give the programmer incredible power, but also require them to have a lot of responsibility because they're able to write code that can do literally anything. In the C language, for example, if I give you an array and I let the user control the index of the array, let's say array of 6969, there are no bounds checks to call out if I go outside of that array. And so here they actually discuss the broad categories of memory safety vulnerabilities, right? There are two broad categories are spatial and temporal. And I've actually never heard it broken down like this, but I really like how this makes it extremely simple to visualize. So the spatial memory safety vulnerabilities issue from memory accesses performed outside of correct bounds established for variables and objects in memory. So that's if you have maybe an arbitrary read where you're given an array and you can specify an index outside of that array. In C, you can do that. There's no question. You will, it'll allow you to compile a program where you give I as an index and I can be any value giving you an arbitrary read primitive. If you're able to write outside of the bounds of a stack based array, you can use that to overflow the control flow information and take control of the program. So all of those rewriting outside of where memory should be written to is a spatial vulnerability. A temporal memory safety vulnerability arises when memory is accessed outside of time or state, such as accessing object data after the object is free to use after free, or where memory accesses are unexpectedly interleaved. That's kind of a race condition, right? Where you have like time of check and time of use. Maybe I read the value to check it, but then it gets written to, and the check happens after it gets read from two different uh, threads. And these two primitives, the temporal and spatial memory corruptions, are the result or are the reason for many cybersecurity vulnerabilities that have enabled the Morris worm of 988. I wasn't alive for that. I was also too young for this one. But Heartbleed in 2014 was a huge one where you could read arbitrarily the private keys out of the OpenSSL library, the BlastPass exploit chain in 2023. So for over 35 years, the same classes of vulnerabilities have vexed the digital ecosystem. There should not be, in my opinion, at this point, the skill issue argument just dies. We've been dealing with the same problems for 35 years. It's just, it's not, I don't, I can't, I don't understand how you can say, oh, just get better. Like, is the world just not good after 35 years? The highest leverage method to reduce memory safety vulnerabilities is to secure one of the building blocks of cyberspace, the programming language. Using memory safe programming languages can eliminate most memory safety issues. While in some distinct situations, using a memory safe language may not be feasible, and that's completely true, in most cases, using a memory safe programming language is the most efficient way to substantially improve software security. Boom. 
Rust mentioned. Actually, Rust has not been mentioned yet, but it's coming. Building new products and migrating high impact legacy code to memory safe programming languages can sufficiently reduce the prevalence of memory safety vulnerabilities throughout the digital ecosystem. To be sure, there are no one size fits all solutions in cybersecurity and using a memory safe programming language cannot eliminate every cybersecurity risk. This is so true. 70% of bugs were memory corruption vulnerabilities, but you still have logic errors. You still have command injections. You still have all of the things that could go wrong that are not a result of memory corruption, but 70%, 70% are memory corruption. However, it is a substantial additional step technology manufacturers can take toward the elimination of broad categories of software uh, vulnerabilities. A recent report authored by CISA, the NSA, FBI, and international cybersecurity agencies entitled The Case for Memory Safe Roadmaps provides guidance for manufacturers with steps to implement changes to eliminate cyber safety vulnerabilities from their products. I have not read this. I'm sure it's great. Now we do move on to another area of memory safe hardware, which is an interesting term I haven't heard of. I think they just mean like secure root of trust hardware, but they do go into an interesting piece uh, about space systems here. The space ecosystem is not immune to memory safety vulnerabilities. However, there are several constraints in space systems with regards to language use. And I did pre-read this and I found the last one very interesting. Let's kind of go through this. First, the language must allow the code to be close to the kernel so that it may tightly interact with both software and hardware. This is either going to be low-level code that rides atop a kernel, or maybe it's even real-time software, an RTOS that can both act as the kernel, touch the hardware, but run user mode applications as well. Second, the language must support determinism so the timing of the outputs are consistent. And again, that's a real-time operating system, meaning that you can determine the timing of when certain tasks are ran. And third, and interesting, the language must not have or must be able to override the garbage collector, a function that automatically reclaims memory allocated by the computer program that is no longer in use. So effectively what they're saying is for some reason that I'm not really sure of, you cannot use a garbage collected language in space. Maybe that has to do with the NASA video that I made. I'll put a card up here for that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting for sure. And this is kind of the, well, the piece de resistance, okay? According to experts, expert me, uh, both memory safe and memory unsafe programming languages meet these requirements. At this time, the most widely used languages that meet all these properties are C and C++. We discussed that previously, which are not memory safe programming languages. Rust! Rust, Rust mentioned, Rust, one example of a memory safe language, has the three requisite properties above, but has not yet been proven in space systems. Oh, we'll get there, buddy. Further progress on development tool chains, workforce education, and fielded case studies are necessary to demonstrate the viability of memory safe languages in these use cases. You heard it here first, folks. White House calling you out right now. Go build a satellite, go make a little cube sat, Write it in Rust, shoot it into space, see what happens, call the White House. All right, cool. Therefore, to reduce memory safety, uh, memory safety vulnerabilities in space and other embedded systems that face similar constraints, a complementary approach to implement memory safety through hardware can be explored. We go into, in this last chapter, some pretty interesting techniques that, uh, that chips use to do memory safety checks. Uh, like memory tagging extensions. It's a new spec uh, from the ARM chipset where effectively in hardware, you can tag a particular heap chunk with a tag, right? It, it, you literally say, this is an object foo. And then if object foo that got tagged in a memory ever gets used as an object bar, it throws a CPU error. Cross check the validity of pointers to memory locations before using them. If they're invalid, the CPU throws an error. There you go. And then formal methods that kind of go into here um, using effectively mathematics to mathematically prove the security of a piece of software. And then they go into their part three where they talk about secure systems. So what do we learn today? Software security is hard and humans make mistakes. The White House is beginning to catch on to the fact that C is great. C++ is okay. Rust is better, but harder. And if we write our code in a memory safe language and use memory safe hardware, maybe we'll get to a future where there are no vulnerabilities. That's it. Welcome to the assembly. Appreciate it. Again, if you're new here, hit that sub button and then go check this video out right there.